Do I recognize any of the people? Does I cover the screen? Or... Oh, that Marty. All right. This bad here, Lindsay, or this good? You can do either one. Or should I get in front? All right. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, welcome to the Tapley Hall, Memorial Hall of the Danvers Historical Society. This is a monthly meeting of the Gene Winter Northeast chapter of the Mass Archaeological Society. Uh, we, we do these every, every month from September to May. I just have to have them backwards, which wouldn't have worked if we don't meet for summer. Uh, first things I want to do is for those of you that are not members of the chapter, we have we have uh, membership forms in the back. Our chapter membership is six dollars a year. There's also MAS memberships in the back, and then the majority of you will get the twenty dollar rate. A couple of you will have to pay the thirty dollar rate, but we have a clean just now. And also, we encourage you to become members of the Danvers Historical Society. Uh, this is just a benefit that we sort of co co host with them, this lecture series. Uh, I have a couple of other announcements. First of all, our chapter and the Danvers Historical Society sponsor an Adel Al Day, our days, that's this coming weekend, the 23rd and 24th at the Rebecca Nurse Homestead in Danvers. It's it's a good take, and I Dave and I always do it. Uh, also, at the same time, Nate Hamilton is a professor at University of Southern Maine. is going to be doing a dig on the property to get that hands-on ability to kind of work with an archaeologist. Uh, and he's got a good dry sense of humor, so that helps. Uh, then the Mass Archaeological Society is going to have its annual meeting on the 21st of October. That is at our the Robbins Museum in Middleborough, Mass. It'll be our annual meeting, which is business. And oh, it's exciting. I know because I run the meeting, so it'll be very quick. I just don't. <laughs> I'm getting the evil eye from my wife in the back. Uh, but we're going to have three lectures, and we're starting a new exhibit on soapstone, steatite vessel. So hopefully that'll be up and running so people can see that new exhibit. Uh, what day of the week is that? That's a Saturday. Okay. 21st? Yeah, the 21st. We haven't actually set the start time, but most likely it will be at 11 o'clock for the business meeting, a break, and then 1 o'clock for the three papers. And hopefully uh, we had a little change. Someone had to work that day that was going to speak, so now we're trying to get it on schedule. Uh, the next meeting here is going to be October 17th, another Tuesday night, same time. Kate Reinhardt is going to talk. Lindsay, do you know if she gave a topic yet? I don't haven't seen anything, but Kate's been a speaker before. She does an excellent job. And for those of you who are MAS members there out in the virtual reality land, get your ballots in. Voting will end soon for the for the trustees. And I think I've covered all the main announcements that I need to make. So with that, I'm going to turn things over and introduce our speaker. David Goodfraud is a registered archaeologist. He works for now it's it now? It was Commonwealth Heritage, and now Heritage. Now it's Chronicle Heritage. Was, we were filling the West for about six months. And we think, <laughs> I guess there's a huge uh, change in the CRM world. Yeah. Um, he's an expert uh, in sort of GIS mapping and remote sensing. He does a lot of projects across the region, not just in Massachusetts, and, uh, in, including the ones you're going to see tonight. And I'm excited because it's, it has underwater, which always excites me. But it, as cemeteries, which I think most people really is the gravel, because I always want to find it with where the bodies are. And it just, it, it really shows you that archaeology is as much a science as it is a craft, and how we're, how we're changing over time. So I'm looking forward to that. So with that, uh, I want to let um, David give his talk. Okay, great. You don't want to hear me. Thank you. <laughs> Well, thanks for having me. I'm David Gutbrad, and uh, hopefully we'll have some fun tonight. Uh, I'm going to cover a couple topics, and we're going to start at the GPR at Worcester. And in the audience, we have a person who helped me, Al Smith, who's with me on that one. And then we're going to go to Magnetometry in Iowa, 
And then the GPR burials at a cemetery in Tampa, which should still a little bit of uh, media is following that one closely. Um, and then the sonar, searching for machine, hope the fog in Massachusetts. And then we can keep going as much time that we have. If you want to interrupt me anytime, ask a question. Let's do that and keep it lively. And uh, uh, we can keep going on as, you know, as much as we have time to go towards the end. So to start out, um, I work for Commonwealth Heritage Group, which has just got bought out by uh, Chronicle Heritage. We're like the largest CRM firm in the world now. And I don't know if that's good for me, but I told people as long as I'm still having fun, I'll participate. <laughs> And they definitely are doing a lot more uh, proposals for remote sensing, which is a good thing, because it is um, something that doesn't destroy the land. I mean, as archaeologists, we try to do our best, but we inevitably leave an impact on the soil. So um, it is a good thing for the future of archaeology to kind of figure out where things are before we go testing and disrupting the soil. Uh, so if you have any questions about remote sensing in particular, I'm not going to get too technical as we go. Let's just get right into the heart of this and look at some of the different projects. Um, let's see here. Go. Worcester Cemetery. So we got a proposal and a story behind it. And it had to do with a 1968 removal in downtown Worcester of bodies. And there was a developer. Had a lot of money and probably had some city councilmen as somebody from the audience might contest to. Uh, they removed the bodies. They brought them over to Hope Cemetery. They know approximately what area it is. It's just a grass lawn. There's no nothing on the top of the lawn. And then recently they put this uh, line up and it says here lies the remains of 111 persons who were buried in the early cemetery at Worcester County. And these are the founders of Worcester. This is this is early mid to late 1700s. Removed to this place during the construction of the Worcester Center in 1968, 47 listed below are interred with their gravestones laid flat above them. The remainder without gravestones are unidentified. And then it has the dates of the 47 uh, chiseled on this brand. So we did GPR over the top. And uh, it's not a very large area. And you can see the cemetery in the back, the more modern cemetery. Uh, we laid out four grids and proceeded to do the transects. And we got data from the transects. We wrote a report and uh, we suggested that several of them are worthy of uh, doing some what we call ground truth. And the cemetery board said, okay, let's pick two. And uh, Al Smith and I went out there and we targeted the same spot, which was the most obvious one uh, in the area. This is what a GPR screen looks like. And on the left is sort of a mock up grid. And on the right is the signal. And you can see there's a lot going on here in the middle. You don't really have to be an expert to read it. You can just tell if there's an anomaly, something's different than around it. And that's really our expertise. <laughs> it's noticing stuff that's a little different than what is around it. I mean, you can get into soils and the strength of the radar that goes down. Uh, but in general, we're just looking for anomalies with the signal uh, that's sent back to the collector. Um, I tried in the field the first day to mark up things for GPS. But again, when I went out, I had the luxury of bringing the data in the field with me. Uh, this is some of the data that it looks like when it's processed. This is obviously something going on here, anomalies, different than the soil around it. And the way you look at this is, uh, this is like me running that lawnmower looking like thing over the top as my arrow is going across. So it's a it's a linear line and that data is bouncing back to my machine. 
So here we got some signals that are different. On the right is process data of the whole grid. And I, I was I was at a project in Michigan with a lot of people from Enbridge who were mad because they had to do this testing. And they said, can't you just tell us where the stuff is? And like, no. They had bought these ranch houses because they almost used them in a domain. And I don't even get how it's possible for a Canadian company to build a tunnel in the United States, but that's what happened. They, they said, well, can't you define the artifacts and the need to do a little bit of on them? And they had these ranch houses that they bought and they stripped them all and there was no carpet or anything and there were plywood sheets. And I go, well, good example is if you look at the plywood the way it's laid out, if I was to go across these lines with my sheet, I might see that little crack. Really not that good, but if I process this with all the transects next to each other, then I can start to see the lines in the sand, or in this case, the lines in the, in the ranch. But that's what this on the right is. And so that's process data with up and down transects pieced together at one level. So you can slice that at 10 centimeters, 20 centimeters, 10 feet. And so this is the particular layer which I teased out the most of the data. And right here ended up being one of the areas we tested in Hope Cemetery. I didn't know what I was going to get. I mean, I definitely wasn't sure. It could have been a very shovel. I don't know. But you start to get comfortable once you ground truth. Again, this is some process data. And this is interesting here. Again, this is the planar view of, let's say, 20 by 20 or 10, 10 by 10 meter. And you see these white kind of foggy lines here. Well, I went back and read. And it said 111 people, but only 47. So everybody was telling me, not only the maintenance of the cemetery, they were telling me I'm going to find a big pot. Like they just dug into the trench and put the bodies in and went to lunch. But not the case. In 1968, they were very, very careful. And what they did is they dug three trenches for the names that were attached to bodies and carefully laid them out. So I was surprised to see that, but I picked this one, right? Uh, we got a contract. I don't want to be leaving with nothing. So, I, which is the which is the anomaly that you would pick, right? So I picked this one on the left. Something's happening there. It's pretty obvious. That's about six feet down, which is our cemetery number, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the planar view of it. The red dot is just me putting a label for the client so they know what I'm talking about. And then Al and I went back and we were preparing for a very large dog and pony show with people standing around, but we got lucky there wasn't a lot. We had to return everything exactly the way it was. We were so concerned for Memorial Day coming that I was gonna leave a mess. So the sod manicure put it right back at the end of it. But as we got down, we got to this. Now, I was excited and then I was also disappointed because it was a concrete liner. And it was probably one of the wealthier people in the cemetery. Maybe they had the largest plot in the original Wisdom Cemetery. But the, uh, let me say, articulation of the remains were not good enough to go on their own. So they built a concrete liner. And if you look in the wall, there's another concrete liner there. And just at that time, the cemetery board member came to ask me how I was doing. It was a lot of work. Now and I were hot, we were tired, but it's like, well, it is a burial. So yes, we did find the burial, but it didn't match the ones that had the headstone, which I really wanted to see. So it's about four o'clock, and we're on that little bit of a monetary constraint. So I picked a shallow one for the second one. And he's a close up to that. This was one of the shallow ones that I showed you earlier. And this is only down about 40 centimeters. And right as I'm getting at it, I get that. Died 1777. Al and I ran over to the monument. There's only one 1777, 1777. And it's Simon. And I didn't even get his name. I got his name from the monument. Went back to the flat headstone. Right, so there, there's a monument where it says uh, Simon Gate 1777. Videos are the way there, but uh, went back, 
But sure enough, when I cleaned it up, that came out. I don't know if I can make that whole thing you see here. That sign of gates. Really nice that stuff. And it was buried in sand about 10 centimeters later. And I didn't go any further. I believe the, the remains are underneath. But they took a lot of time. They actually buried it with care. And um, that was part of our report, how well they actually did care for these and how they were separated. And they took respect putting them back in. So that was a successful ground truthing of GPR. And a good example and an exciting conclusion to a relatively small project that we actually are continuing because they are trying to raise money and an idea of what they're going to do with the rest of it. A lot of concerns, what if it breaks when they bring it up, how are they going to present it, how many are they going to do, what happens if some of them aren't in great condition and some are. There's a lot of questions there, but at least now we can bring them to the surface and uh, we saved them obviously a lot of disruption from hand digging would have been it would have been crazy. So any questions on that? Yeah. What was their original question? What, what, what they the wanted question? to present the remains as if it were the original burial ground. They wanted those headstones, they're beautiful, brought up to the surface. Okay. The cemetery board, friends of the Pope Cemetery. Okay. So I think they hadn't thought it through completely, but they imagined. 47 grave sites on top of the remains. And it's a good, it's a good goal. I don't know. I don't know if it'll be completely achieved, but at least some of it will happen. So did they not have the original records from 67? Or when they were That's a good question. 68. You'd think there'd be a file somewhere, but we haven't found it. So you masked it. So, uh, Mr. Thomas, okay, back in the uh, mid 90s, okay, 95, and um, they were just doing an archaeological reconnaissance with Mr. Thomas because they were putting in two bus dumps and using federal money hmm. for them. So, I was part of the team that went down here and we found six foot headstones hmm. laying down of the people that they didn't get to oh. in Worcester Com. Oh. And then in that report, it was uh done by Mass Archaeological Society, they, uh, I mean, uh, no, yes. Mass, I'm sorry, no, no, no. Mass Amherst, our services, they reiterate the whole history about mm -hmm. what they did in the front of Pope Cemetery came forward, and they, we have pictures in that report where they basically put out the money and talk and I didn't know about the cemetery, mm -hmm. but it was a project that there wasn't much history on. Yeah. It was just sort of, we sort of pieced together. Yeah. Um, and that's the fun of it, really, is piecing yeah. those stories together. Yeah. So um, we have more that ended up at Hope Summit. Yeah. And there's probably okay. some still there in the fringes that yes. haven't been developed. Oh, what's the problem? I know they have a presentation area of headstones that were prettier that don't have the bodies. Okay. So they removed the really nice ones to satisfy people. They didn't the bottom. They just put the headstones in a little corner of Worcester. Okay. Probably like a memorial now. Yeah. And that was should have been removed in the first place. Right. From the United City Hall. Should have been left like that. Right. So the big drawer was in the newspaper and then. In 1968, or more. Yeah. More current than that. and ensuing. Right. So let's shift gears. Now, this is a magnetometry project. We can go back and talk about anything. Any other questions? No problem. Uh, this was uh, a couple of years ago. I was asked to come out for our company, and that line coming across is a pipeline. And, uh, you know, the pipelines definitely drive a lot of the testing. So, there was a state shippo who found that there was a burial mound that's no longer there within 100 feet, and there was the possibility that it would be disrupted by the pipeline. There already was an existing pipeline. Pipeline, this is just another pipeline that adds to it. So GPR may have given a signal, but it wouldn't have been very pronounced given its history. 
And when I show you a picture of what it looks like, it's a farm cornfield. So the magnetometer, um, it, what it does is it has, this particular one has two stevium uh, readings that look for the gradient and the change in the Earth's magnetic field. Very subtle and extremely detailed to the nanotesla. I mean, for example, the pipeline was like 5,000 nanotesla. And this particular Indian burial is 50. And when you see the photos of the data, it's remarkable. But let's sort of give you a little bit more of a background. This is the pipeline from the groove. That's what the area looks like. It's just a cornfield. And again, GPR would struggle with running into um, terrain issues. Even the corn would be knocking that around. Whereas the magnetometer you carry might be a picture of me carrying it. Um, this is from the site form, 1997. Cornfield near the Skunk River. Um, this is sort of sensitivity areas in my original grid setup. So I get three grids right over the pipeline because I kind of need to know what I'm looking for and where I'm getting signals. And this fourth grid is right over the barrier. Line. And to be truthful, we actually had to cut it out of the report because Enbridge didn't want to pay for me being outside of the right of the For me, it was a benchmark for knowing what a very amount looks like. And it helped me on a later project for this year in Florida looking for very amount. So uh, this is a graphic of the three grids I showed you over the pipeline. This is the magnetometer data basically representing those grids. So you see the pipeline coming through the top, and then that represents the blue with red. Uh, what it's picking up is a dipole. Like if you have a magnet, you have a positive and a negative. So there's always both extremes when you're doing magnetometry. But it does come up really clearly. What we were more interested in are the more subtle ones down here. These are of a range of 100. So this is 5,000 plus or minus, meaning minus 5,000 and plus 5,000. Versus these are like 100. And this was a steel or a hardware fence in the bottom. So we ended up round truthing three, again, mostly constrained by budget, three of the, the best ones. And they found three features and about 150 artifacts from a late archaic site. Really subtle features that were um, fire feature and another one was soil redeposited, but redeposited two or 3,000 years ago. And the um, photographs of that, I don't know if I have them, are, you have to be an archeologist to interpret it, it's not, Wow, like the headstone looks very subtle soil change. But the magnetometer was pretty instrumental in, in uh, finding it. That's a uh, planar view of the pipe line cutting across, and we gave it a 3D sort of uh, image. Um, and you can see quality control between the grids changing a little bit. So there's one of the features of the magnetometer slight rise in the data. And you can see it below the plow zone. Darker feature could have been uh, habitational. I'm not sure if there's charcoal pulled out of that, but GPR would have been not pulling that out. Uh, resistivity maybe, but the magnetometer you know, is pretty successful with that. Um, that's what the top would look like. So up here, it is sort of me playing hooky. I took the machine over while they were doing that and found the two known mounds. It's just the grass field, but the reports in the uh, 1930s and 40s were a five-year 
mound with human remains. And obviously the Tippo and the Shippo were both highly concerned that there was war still there. And there were artifacts on the surface noted. That's sort of what a magnetometer looks like when I'm carrying it. And that has a machine around your belt that has a screen that waits for you to sort of mark your transects and then mark intervals between the transects so that you can reposition because nobody's really perfect. If you're doing a mile on this, you start to notice you're off a foot or two. So that mark allows you to reshift it when you're processing to get a straight line across the um, It looks a little awkward and there's a lot of cords, but once you're getting on the hang of it, it's especially if nobody's talking to you and you're just sort of doing your work, you can kind of get through a, an acre maybe in a day. And that's sort of some of the data. Um, gradient time and dates and things like that. Any questions on magnetometry over a Indian burial mound that is now a cornfield? Okay, so let's keep going. Another example, remote sensing, is this cemetery in Tampa. So we get a call, well, the Florida office got a call and they said, we have a owner of a cemetery, it's a private cemetery, an Italian cemetery, and they want to build on this grassy area. There are articles in the Tampa newspaper for lost uh, African American cemetery. People approached the cemetery during ceremonies, funeral ceremonies, and complained that cars were being parked on their relatives. And of course, they fought back and said there's nothing there. So about eight years ago, they hired a utility GPR guy. So he's not an archaeologist. He ran transects sort of in the line, that yellow line. I was taking mention of that. He did a report, a report that resembled a utility worker's report. And he said, I don't think there's much here. He used five meter spacing between the transects. So that's like, it's a pretty large gap, five meters. And he had the cemetery owner got enough pushback that he had to kind of dig deeper. So he hired our company. He, I didn't even get to go down there. I had to use these five meter separate transects and reprocess the data in my living room. And, and I didn't do that right away. I just started getting into the research. And the fun part about this, the lucky thing that I'm able to do is sort of start to piece together this puzzle. That's the fun, I guess, of any of these projects. And they lead you down all sorts of rabbit holes. <laughs> and I went on to the aerials. We did, you know, overlays of the aerials and, and the uh, atlas maps. And I went to a 1925 atlas map in the town records which are now online. And I was amazed at everybody telling me there was nothing there. And take a look at this right in the center of your screen. 1925 on the city, the city records. You think they put that on there? I mean, talk about marginalized. There's no way they didn't use that property. If they were allowed to, they used it. And so, <laughs> You know, I'm, in the, I'm a little bit shocked. And I'm also shocked at the way it was handled. I'm trying to, you got to call that down as I'm going through the data. So now I'm trying to look now at the data because I, I start to believe. So one of the things you can do with GPR is you can do a cut through in a 3D model. And what this will do was I can go up and down on that surface and it will give me anomalies at whatever depth I ask you to do across a width, so in this case, this is five meters. But as I started to do it, and I put these red boxes on because for me, it was obvious, but for everybody else, it was like, well, I don't see anything. I was like, okay, well, that's true. It could be water table, but, and there is a high water table in Tampa. But if I go up to three feet, that's gone. And when I started putting the boxes around it, and then I started to look at, 
the streets that are in cemeteries are like these avenues that are cleared. And then there's, you know, avenues where the, where the burials are. It lined up perfectly. So this is actually, I'm, not, I'm probably going beyond what I should be talking about. This is still happening. And he's still resisting the owner of the property. He has now come to terms with maybe there's something on that end of it. And she said there was nothing, but now we're going to go back and I'm going to do GPR in the middle in a select area because he wants to build a bigger mausoleum. And I do think the mausoleum was built on it as well. But, uh, the articles in the newspaper by the Tampa uh, newspaper are between five and 10 other cemeteries that we they call them forgotten African-American cemeteries, but they're still there. And the people who live there, grandparents grew up there, know that their their relatives are still there. So it's contentious to say the least. And that one's ongoing and highly political, I guess would be the right word. Uh, any questions on the Tampa African-American Cemetery about technique or I put in ground truth thing. I'm going through our company in Florida. They're going through a conversation. I, I thought it made sense, but I think he's worried about the results, right? So now he said, well, I'd rather go place, maybe it is over there, but I want you to go over here. And so he came back with this little grid and I slid the grid up over so the corner would get where I had looked at their data. That's supposed to happen this month. So I get, I drove down on this one, but I get worried going through TSA with these boxes that look like James Bond and I'm gonna get arrested. So I may have to fly on that one. It's just a worry because I know they'll stop me and they'll go through everything. But that will be a, a good solution though if we can actually stop them from building on that mausoleum. If you look at, the aerials, uh, this mausoleum wasn't there in 1980. And you can see that nice square that resembles the plaque on the city map in 1925. And this is the avenues I was talking about. You can see those avenues probably continued. Um, these were streets and houses up here that they took over and put a catch water basin when they were redoing the city. Could be stuff up here too, but. They, they're trying to make money. They want to sell more space. So that's that driver. So marginalized group, not the first time we've heard that. Okay. That's the Tampa Cemetery. The next one is Sonar Ponkapog in Massachusetts. So this is a pond, which I tell you, I've driven on 128, like you guys have a million times. And I never saw this exit. It's exit two when you're on 128. I think you know that we number them, but it's right before you get to the 93 Route 3 split if you're going on it. And it's a dedicated exit to this beautiful park, Hoka Park Park. It's amazing. Um, so we have been a phase 1B over the whole pond. We're doing some restoration at what we call Fisherman's Cove. And then there's a AMC or a park up here for the rentals. And then over here, we also did testing because they're doing some minor road work. And the testing was positive here, negative here, and we believe we may have located the potentially the remains of the open frog train village. It's already in site, but nobody had ever made that link. To the early to mid 1600s, which is fascinating in its own right. But uh, David Robinson and our own Victor Stone um, had did machine hunting, machine searching in with Sigamon in Worcester and found three submerged Native American canoes with rocks on them. And they submerged them to keep them away from other people using them or finding them. When they needed them. So Pokemon was kind of a good candidate to do sonar. Uh, so a lot went into this. This is like a two-year back and forth permitting after our phase 1B and getting everything arranged. But 
we designed this uh, grid, which is in red, for coverage mostly, ran transects east to west. Had to get this old, you know, I had this old aluminum boat, made sure that wasn't gonna, wasn't gonna leak, which it did, and I had to actually get the coffin before I did it. But the equipment we brought on board was crazy. It looked like a bunch of crazy scientists coming out in this little aluminum boat. But uh, the idea was to find the shoot. And if we could see uh, remnants or anomalies is our favorite word, which actually David asked me not to use anomaly, just use a, a, a mark areas. We don't want to call them anomalies, but that's actually too far. You don't know what they are. Yet. This is the data actually processed by Goldman Research. Uh, who brought the equipment out? And if you're about to enlarge that, you start to see maybe there's a lot of uh, vegetation in this pond and a lot of rock. When we did testing here on the land, it was remember last year when the water levels were ridiculous in September, October? You could have walked up to your knees. And, was, and so all the rocks were above the water. And um, when we did it, there was about six to eight feet. So yeah, we had a different water table this year, but uh, a lot of these uh, shades are actually uh, outcropping. You know, glacial outcrops, uh, glacial erratics. This is the data. Now, again, the, the most important thing you're going to take in the GPR is really just the research before and using it just as a tool. I try to distance myself from that whole prospecting idea that we're gonna see something when we're out there with the equipment, because I don't even know what we're looking for. This is from the machine report, uh, which is now run by the NITMOC. It's their site and then, uh, Linda, the head of Cheryl. the- Cheryl. Cheryl, that's right, yeah. Taking the bottom of the and uh, it's a great website. I urge you to go on there and, and search that. It's, it's pictures. This is a drawing by David, one of the old classic drawings, Lost Still, a beautiful drawing on that. Um, and it's only about, I want to say, between 10 and 15 feet deep. No, 26. 20? 26. 26. Oh, there's three of them, right? They're all about that deep? One and two are 26. One and two are 26. Okay. Um, these are photographs. Surprised you got that much light. That's not so three is at the bottom. Oh, okay. So this is the shadow. Yeah. Gotcha. But this is interesting for us because this allowed me to see what it looked like through the radar. That's pretty soft. Could have been a log. But they're not in the machine. So we went and it was all the equipment. We had batteries. I had to bring a pickup truck because the you can't use a motor in this pond. So we had an electrical motor, which needs to be the two hours on. We had two truck batteries and at lunch started the truck and then swapped it out before the truck died and put the old battery in and let the truck charge the battery. And then this is what the sonar looks like. That little piece there that is kind of hung over the edge of the boat and dropped down two or three feet in the water. Pretty small boat, but it worked. That's some of our electronic equipment. And I think Lee, Lee was definitely nervous if we were going to take out any water. We might have had a hundred thousand dollars in equipment. <laughs> Sure. I have to be psychologist and psychiatrist as a remote sensing professional because there's definitely some talking off the edge of that. Uh, that's what it looks like though on um, the side of the boat. I will say though, we got shallow and we were picking up rocks. He was pulling that thing up and he was scared it would get knocked over. It has these release clips that he uses when it's in deep water that it won't damage him with this it'll release from the cable, the electric cable, it goes to his computer. Uh, 
So this is the data. And we came up, so when we were out there, I, I was overlooking the data. The lines are transect shadows. So that's sort of the way that comes out in the, in the data. Um, the shadows, so that's a shadow, not a shoe. There's a rock there and that's a long half shadow in the sun. And we started in the morning and these are the afternoon transects. So the ones in the bottom have a, a sh more of a shadow than the ones at the top, which I actually, uh, talking about, I probably should have mentioned that in the report one. Because um, this is sort of uh, the first time this has been done. At least in Massachusetts, and David was really excited about creating a, uh, you know, a map that other researchers can use and follow in other ponds. I mean, we have samples of pouring done in a lot of ponds and getting information from soil pourings under the water, but not sonar. It's been a little bit out of reach. So we were trying to set a template on how to do sonar in uh, near bodies of water. So these four anomalies were picked out. Um, Lee wasn't happy with any of them. And I actually asked him to go back. David asked me to ask him to go back to tease out a little more of the photographs of those anomalies for potential, not ground truthing, but I guess underwater truthing. Now, this is sort of a one transect and we're coming along the middle here underneath the boat. This is, this is all vegetation. Bad, right? Vegetation. We tried to pick uh, early, early spring, you know, March, still pretty cold in April, but it, the growth is pretty, pretty dense there. And it probably was because the water was so shallow last year. Um, but the other interesting thing that we learned was sort of transect width. Originally proposed close transects because of what I mentioned before about having too much distance between the transect, but with the boat and sonar, it casts a nice uh, 15, 20 meter overlap. So we, we did uh, 10 meters, but we got more data and overlapping data than which re 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 reassures your data, but you don't need to go quite as close. On the way also depends how high up you are and how deep the water is. The higher up, if you're 30 feet, it's gonna have a, a larger cone across. Um, again, these are shadows, but what we are looking for is something a little bit more like this. And this could be a rock face. It's got a little bit too much of a linear suggesting maybe man-made. Um, it's not great, but it was enough. David got excited about it and we kind of we did our report to showcase this and, and the two other ones. So more on that in a year or two. I think that's sort of in progress. This is right up to date, um, a month from recent uh, report filing. So. Uh, that will be interesting. I think going back to the research on that, uh, this is the Machoon Project's sonar, and that one very pronounced there. Like a half of the hall almost. It's, it's a small boat. Yeah, that's the small boat that was sunk. That's right. So the Machoon wasn't even, that was a sample of a modern boat. That's right. I forgot about that. That's good. And this is some of the sonar from that. So are these tires? I mean, the, the big thing, that's an oil drum. An oil drum. So it's a lot smaller than you think, huh? It's this is just a 55 gallon hull. Yeah. Boy, it's huge. But those are only 13 foot long. They're only 13 and they're not whole. Mostly whole? Yeah. Huh. But it's, it is these tires. No, it's, it's, it's angled. You're the you're the tool that sure you're, sure yeah, yeah. so the chip gets all distortion and yep and the image you show not this the one that is a blow up of the of the mm -hmm. that actually a stitched together image 
See, like that looks like it's a, uh, a small sailboat with the sail up on top. Sure, of it. like a sunfish. Yeah, but none of these have been uh, brown food. Waterproofed. <laughs> uh, it's six pounds. Brown brown brown. Brown. No one's dove on them or dropped an ROV. But I think for David, looking at these, those first, those two images side by side, you can start to get what they look like. Yeah. See that image? That's that's probably stitching the storage when they're not actual chain in the background. In other words, it doesn't, it looks like it compresses towards the left. That's it does. probably that's probably the portion of yeah. taking and like, putting images together, taking a different type. Yeah, but that was done by a diver. He took a solar image diving over the top. No. Oh, they, the photograph is, of course. The yeah. photograph is probably, I think, a dozen plus photographs. Sure. Stitched together, overlay. Oh, that's not one single photo. Uh, and if you look oh, the no. stern, what I would call the stern, is a bottle uh, right in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Heineken. <laughs> is that what it is? No. <laughs> Some of the pictures, it comes out green. Right. But I think that's algae. Yeah, that's pretty obvious. Is that just lucky that it fell in there? Yeah. Oh, that's that, that, that like that pond is up lots of or did somebody go down there and just different, different no <laughs> lots of different that's interesting. Uh, ice fishing in the middle. Well, that's poke pog, and again, that one is definitely ongoing. It's got multiple components which make it fascinating. And the area we only did one transect and we barely finished the catalog recently. There's a thousand artifacts from that. And uh, that's, a, that's a real nice hot spot there. I, I was trying to go back to this map and figure, well, if I had it new a thousand years ago, I'm not going to put it in here just to go across here. I'd probably go from here at the farthest point. And this is all wetland, so not too much fun coming in and out anyway. So I figured where the praying village was, the farthest possible point be somewhere down here. And it got really shallow here, but then on the, on the right side, it was about three feet right up to the shore. So I was hopeful that we would have gotten something here. But again, this is, up here was going to test it. We didn't do sonar up here to find a, find a potential praying village. Obviously, that would be a great information, and that may have something. If these don't turn out to be cultural, that we're in the grid. So I would recommend anytime you're on 128, taking this exit, you can good walk, but there's beautiful uh, park and um, a boardwalk that goes out, and uh, it goes out sort of into wetlands. It's pretty unique. It's that area there. Any questions? Yeah, go. The uh, project problem could go with the swamp is because previously we were running a lot of it. Sure, yeah. that's true. And that's why these right. sites are on the north side. And they Yeah. Did you ever go through that collection? Because we talked about it a lot in the field. They're like, oh, we got to go check this collection. Yeah. So much. It's, it's, all, a lot of work. it's all convenience. <laughs> it's all documented. A lot of it. Uh, well, Papa Lucky did a lot of that. Hmm. Plus, it's done a lot of it. Yeah, you're right. Uh, this is a good spot to put it in the water. And I think there's a golf course. Yeah, so it's right. Most of the year, it's like 1892. Yeah, that's all a golf course now. Yeah. Could be worse, I guess. That was just me because uh, as a geologist, and I can see that. Well, it would be pretty good preservation there, I would think, if we were to get something. I don't know how we would do sonar though in swamp. We'd have to go back to a different right. technique. Something that would glide over that you could pull me. The artifacts went all the way out from the end of the map was west side of that peninsula from the north side. Yeah, we had right up the middle. Yeah, one transit is right under the pump. Yeah, right here. 
That's why I'm thinking because that was the main site that's probably on water in front of Oh, yeah, that's the boardwalk trail. Yeah. What, what time is this? What? what time is this? I'm not sure. Oh, you I don't think we have. I don't think we have earlier shed there. We don't have. We have all woodland. There might be middle with arcade there. There's a lot of down the museum. Yeah, that's right. We should match it up, which is that's a that's a whole story there, right? With all this stuff. I always use that last scene in Raiders of the Lost Ark where he's taking part of that <laughs> warehouse and goes sits yeah. in the warehouse, right? That's where the rest of that stuff goes. Uh, the Massive Control Commission was excited about it because they had never known that uh, or found where the contact area site was. And that really interesting. Uh, just a side note, if you guys pardon my interruption, I was just telling Vic about this little assessment I did out at the West Dover Airport. And it was this sort of like non descriptive building that happened to be in a uh, it's on the Westover property, which was, it's now Air Reserve. And this is on the National Register. It was built by the quartermaster uh, in 1940. Windows were filled, but um, I went by to do the assessment and I wasn't that excited. But like I always underestimate, I went and did the research and there was a sit-in in 1972. 500 to 1,000 people, that's our building back with the windows. Uh, still there. This is the president of Amherst College and his wife and the police. 500 people, and uh, this is a sit in, right? And it, they look how angry these guys look at her. <laughs> and there's the news is there with their old microphones and the camera and the note taker from the journal. And, Are we going to see Vic in this photo? No, but no. John Wilson. He knew how to stay out of political. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> this is completely off topic, but I just, I'm, I'm just sort of something I'm fascinated with because it got a thousand people got arrested and uh, they dragged into the buses. And now that this building was just a, you know, it was on the register, but I don't know if it was eligible or not. National Register was a state register. Uh, now it becomes a little bit more important of this event. So that's how I'm going. All right, sorry about that. Back to the topic. <laughs> I got off tangent. But we're all about tangents, right? We got to keep it lively. What are I doing? Projects done. Uh, let me go back to the last couple. Okay. It was a Vietnam War, 1972 objection to the recent troops that were sent over by the Nixon. And they were sitting in there. Um, yeah. Um, okay, how are we doing? Are everybody good on time? Or... Yeah. Yeah, good. Right. Okay. No one's put any questions yeah. in the chat. Right. If anyone yeah. online does have questions, please. So here's a couple different ones. This one was how I was training. And this was from, uh, I don't know if you come on. He's brilliant. Uh, he lives in Kansas. He teaches at uh, University of Kansas. But he integrates the remote sensing on his sites. And he took this previous army city, okay, uh, in Kansas. And this is what it looked like in 1917. It's not too far off from the Westover Airport photographs. But anyway, it's not there now. It's just a grass field. But he used GPR, magnetometry, resistivity, conductivity, and overlaid it. Really, really well done. And it's amazing how each one teased out a little bit of the different information. So I used his training that he taught me and everything that when I'm explaining to people because it's it's sort of a, a layers, you know, like you talked about peeling the onion layer back. Okay, that's what it looks like now. Grass field, I think. Oh, this is a former railroad, I believe. And I believe they were doing some project. The town was going to build, um, might have been a water uh, facility, but that's its first overlay on the aerial with the former streets drawn in. And obviously, he had to pick a smaller area because, you know, that's a pretty large area to do a lot of remote sensing. But this is a great example of the different techniques 
Okay, so the first one is electric electrical resistivity. Now, if you can get past all these drawings and labels to tell uh, and see the way the data comes out. The second one is GPR. The third one is EM conductivity. This is this is the magnetometer, and this is magnetic susceptibility. So what he did is he took all of these and layered them on top, and he was able to find the streets, the theater, the, the pharmacy, literally recreate the entire the entire city. It was crazy. He did this uh, probably between 02 and 06. Oh, no liar. No, no liar. It's uh, it's pretty flat though. I don't know. Probably got some streets, maybe. All right, for right. Yeah, it's for right, yeah. That's what I mean. You can see the rail yeah. bed and star easily, but wow. Be interesting to see LIDAR and compare. And see yeah. what you got. Because now we can use the LIDAR and say, what are we getting? This is what we got. We already heard the ground truth. That's pretty, pretty fascinating. So is that the composite now? That's the composite and the color coded. I'm trying to. Increase the uh, zoom. I don't know why that's not going up. Is there a zoom on this? Where is that? More? Kind of locked. Right oh, it's, no. yeah. You see it? I thought I, I thought I did too. Well, you're in Zoom. You're not on your screen. So I can't. I can't. No, you can screen. do it from your from my device. Yeah, from your desktop. You're you're in Zoom right now. Right. So what would I do to enlarge that? Well, you, right. you can't enlarge it in Zoom. I can pull Zoom to fit. All right. Oh, you're saying if I got out of the Zoom. Yeah, because you're showing. And went to my screen. Yeah. Uh, Whatever. Does that work? I just click on that. No, it opens it up. It's, it's a bully. All right. It's bully. If you know what you mean, though, I could probably get yeah. it to go it outside. So. Well, that's good enough. But anyway, that's sort of a teaching tool that I like to bring up because it really gives all the labels. I mean, I can read them out to you. They're pretty small. But you can kind of make out piping, building structure, landfill, foundations, um, electrical pipe, water mains, brickwork, concrete. So we created a city. That's just a grass field. Okay, so using that, I had a project up in Michigan, and this is sort of what not to do <laughs> GPR on. This is Enbridge with a lot of money and a big project going under the Mackinac Straits, which is that hand in the top of Michigan that connects up the peninsula. They're building a tunnel. And the Ojibwe tribe, which was going to force there because the English and French resettled and they have burial mounds that were known, but not, no, we don't know where they are now, recorded in documents from the 1600s, 1700s. So Enbridge said, well, this GPR, the whole thing. And they were using it as a tool to say where stuff isn't. And that's not really what. Is the best way to use that tool. It's not saying what isn't there. I don't know. There could still be stuff there that's just not getting picked up. But when we did the research with the Michigan um, part of our company, they had, you know, did pest pits and we had high sensitivity areas and we matched them up with documentation and, you know, landforms and we picked the areas that we wanted to do. It was about three acres. They wanted to expand to 45 acres and it's trees, marsh. And it was kind of daunting. It was, and I, I it kind of fell on my lap and it grew as the project grew. And I ended up getting five crews trained. I trained them all. They didn't even know how to read the data. I just do this, give me the data. And it was all about data collection and data management. So I had these files of data where they came from, processed them. And, um, each machine was a little different, each operator was a little different. But I would say it was successful in doing it for 
archaeology on a large scale. Um, it wasn't necessarily successful for them finding where the stuff isn't, because uh, even areas that I didn't have uh, anomalies, I didn't say that, that they were low sensitivity. Um, there were roads, different types of terrain, it's almost like a tundra there. Uh, large scale stuff. And then it rained all the time, which impacts the GPR data that it made contact with the ground. It'll go through. I mean, it goes through everything, but it's definitely skewed the data when you see it. It's very blurry on the top. Uh, that was like a typical transect of a uh, 15 by 30 meter uh, with some anomalies, not like we saw with the cemetery. Uh, a lot of geology studying here because you start to get striations which resemble the geological formations here. You start to kind of you see where that is below bedrock there. Uh, a lot of note taking. Yeah, that's the upper peninsula, and the lower peninsula is a little more settled. I'd show you a Google history of that, but uh, that one. Like I said, it was more of a learning curve with a large scale um, property. But again, we, we were trained on if you were to get uh, approached by protesters. And I'm like, well, I, I'm actually on their side of the protesters. I, don't know. I was really put in a weird place because they had to do all this training and they said, you know, just call this number and don't make eye contact. And there was incidences, like we had a couple of trucks come by and kind of intimidate us, but I was like, anytime that happens in the field now, once we talk to them, they're usually buddy-buddy with us because we're cultural resource management. We're interested in the resources and I'm not interested in Enbridge expanding their empire. So I, I wanted to find the mounds, but because it was so tree covered and they, we didn't cut trees down, we never really got to the target areas that we wanted to do. We let them drive as the client. And we did do ground truthing. After I left, there was a month and a half of three crews of ground truthing, um, but no pre-contact mounts. And now I also had that, I was armed with that Indian burial mound magnetometer. I offered magnetometry and that's still in queue. And I think another company took it over because the management wanted us to kind of do what we didn't we were, we were comfortable doing. Any questions on Mackinac Straits? Any thoughts? Doesn't even have to be a question. Okay. Bloody Bluff back to Massachusetts. So Bloody Bluff is in the Lexington Concord Battle. As they're leaving Concord. This, you probably probably driven on this. This is right to the Mid Park. There's a big cliff here that's exposed. We drive by it all the time. It doesn't look that great, but a lot happened there. The British were running. They regrouped on this. They were tired. They were disheveled. They were all over the place. And uh, I don't know. I forget my history. Was it uh, Pitcairn or was it somebody else? They kind of said, look, we got to. I forget, but they reassembled here. And the farmers, this wall is probably not there. This is more of a 19th century wall. Could have been, I don't know. But they were in the woods here, fire on this direction as I'm pointing. So we, Marty Dudek, who I work with, designed a project of metal detecting. We did a class down at Valley Forge uh, with these experts. Um, and then I took the magnetometer. I didn't know how it was going to work because it's under the power lines. So I didn't know the thing is so sensitive. I thought the power line would blow it up. It actually didn't. The only thing it did do was with the guy ones. And of course, these guys over the years, when they work on the power lines, they get up on those ladders and they throw it. It's scattered. So that was one of the big problems. That, we were finding power lines scattered debris, and the data would pick those out. 
But we did find, not with magnetometer, but with the metal detectors, uh, two lead musket balls, which is pretty fascinating. And they were in the side of the hill. So where this bridge floor, this dropped down about three or four meters. This is high, and this drops down to this path. Like this is a pretty steep grade of this road. And we found two musket balls that lodged in the side of this hillside. And the direction would have been from these trees. And the bridge would have been on top and probably down here at the bottom regrouping. Um, and I forget now, did we get any other artifacts of the period? So we get to a lot of things want to go there, find out where the mind is. Out of the street, they can see it. There is a uh, Stars of the Revolution monument, I think. Yeah. Yeah, the Minuteman Park monument. Right over the thing. Right here, you can walk to. That's a steep cliff drop off and bring it down on the street. Yeah, that's really steep. That's about 70 feet high. Right. And, uh, it changes in about 10 vertical. Is that number 2A? This is 2A. Yeah. And um, Parker's Revenge is sort of down here. Which happened right after this one as well. What caliber was a musket ball? You know? Oh, that's a good question. <clears throat> I'm gonna go like that. <laughs> <laughs> and there was they were they had in that. Uh um, you 75 caliber. The Americans at that point would have used and gone those black. That's right. And you know what we did have calibers. I think they were smaller. They were between 65 and 68. Oh, but I'd have to check our catalog. British would have used it in 75. And that's how we knew that they weren't British. Yeah, thank you for reminding me because they, you're right, they were standardized and the farmers melted and took whatever they had. Whatever they had left yeah. yeah, and it was smaller. Yeah. And we didn't know if that was from the impact or, you know, some had fallen off or uh, or it was whole. But yeah, they were smaller. Yeah, that's good. So, uh, I guess in winding up, um, I've been lucky to do a lot of different projects. I get fascinated with each one to kind of do the rabbit hole of research because that really is the driver for all of the success of the project. It's not the remote sensing. The remote sensing is kind of uh, a confirmation of what you may already be looking for. So we do a lot of proposals now for our cemeteries. And the first thing I'll do before I do the proposal is see where they're at, what are they expecting to find. And then you get an idea of how successful you're going to get with what particular remote sensing you use. Um, otherwise, it's like they think it's Superman and you're going to look through the soil with your beam. And it's, although I did show you Kavami's re establishment of that city, Army City in Kansas, which is an amazing job. Uh, most of the time, you really need a purpose to do it. That's why the cemetery is the ideal because you're already in a confined area, you know bodies are there. Um, the Bloody Bluff was good because it let us know we can do it under power lines as long as it's not next to the guy weather, which really only showed up like a little uh, plot of red. You know, it wasn't like it contaminated all the data, but uh, it was helpful to know that we could do that. Uh, GPR, the restriction is that you got to be able to make contact with the ground. So it has to be cut. And you can't do that in some of the forested, um, you know, even brush. You couldn't do it. So it's, lim it's limited on that. A lot of Civil War sites are kind of torn on that issue because they could use GPR, but a lot of it's in the woods. Um, we did a Princeton survey at the Battle of Princeton looking for this mass burial. And some of it we did was in the grass, other areas was in woodsy kind of areas. And you have to pause the machine and carry it around the tree. And then you start up again and the tree roots come up a little bit. So you don't always know, especially they're not gonna take their time at the end of the battle presenting a really nice cemetery. Although after the Worcester example, I really do think People respected, especially a soldier, the burial more than we give credit to. And I do, I do think they did things if they had the time the right way. Uh, but anything else we can cover?
I'm open to any suggestions. We can revisit anything. Any questions? We can take a few questions. No one's on. Um, that's just so well, we didn't just get that email to me uh, about uh, this. Link that you were on. You know, if I was revenge, like we found a billboard. A what? Billboard. Oh, billboard. A curb like a symbol. Mm -hmm. What is it? Explain it. They, they used to, uh, at Jamestown, they wanted a whole bunch of them. And then we found one of them practically the end of the cliffs of the carpet. You know, we would give it right out of the sky and on the base to enhance the nipple space. Hmm. And it was only a down about four inches. Hmm. And we were never detected. And they found that a lot, a lot of monkey ball fell in the sky, some of them weren't shy. And what they call mold. That's called cool. mold. Yeah. Yeah, the metal detecting is tricky because obviously lead is not going to give you a big response, but the newer metal detectors have a little bit of a range. We were using that 10 to 15 number, I know, versus 80 or 100 for bottle tab tops from the 70s, which were getting a high signal. Because donuts, we used to stand with them on a column, we would stand at a donut detector and a monkey. And we were thinking that the Americans, when they were fighting the British, were in the woods on both sides of the road. We were attacking the British at the time. Both sides, yeah. And when they fired at the and couldn't reload fast enough, they were probably using the donuts because there was no handle to them because they couldn't fly away by now. Uh, we think that people carry it in a simple way as a weapon. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, so you did this survey. Mm -hmm. you, you only found two of them? Two musket balls. Yeah. So we dug up grade one. We dug up probably a thousand anomalies. Yeah, it just suggests that 999 were bottle of pull taps. <laughs> And the guy that we worked with, um, Al, you might remember his name. Um, he's on uh, Antique Roadshow yeah. all the time. Oh, yeah. He went to school at Minuteman High School, and he was swearing to himself all the times when he was in high school drinking beer <laughs> over in that field, <laughs> taking taps. I had the perfect cycle of that. He thought when he was 18, he was all cool throwing those out, and now he was responsible for digging those out. He's done a lot of the survey throughout the whole back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's surprising that if they were removing it, the people wouldn't drop a lot. Yeah. Uh, it's been monkey around very long. The power lines in the 60s and 70s did a lot of impact, especially there. They definitely graded and moved soil around. And, and I think a lot of people were looking through there over the last 200 years, and then they found it themselves, and it's on, it's on the dresser at home. Yeah, in the dresser drawer. In the dresser drawer, not labeled, nothing to it. Earlier, you would talk about finding the, the pits using the the GPR, oh, no, the negatometer, and I've only been familiar with that happening if it had been heated. You yeah, it's the stone that has a magnetic signature. So, I, is it just the sensitivity of the instrument you use that really can pick up that, or is it? It, it does pick up fire features for sure. That is one of its trademarks, and that look right there could have been. There wasn't. There was some charcoal visible, but I think what it did pick up is soil uh, relocation. Um, it's kind of like I use that example of obsidian because I used to do stuff in Mesoamerica when they do the dating of that because when it cools, it's all in one direction based on the magnetic poles. At that time, they can kind of date it within a hundred thousand years or whatever. But, they, but it's the same with this: when the soil gets redeposited, it leaves a different magnetic signature. And that can be picked up. And it is small. It's 25 to 50 nanotesels, which that is what that red is right there. That is so one of the things I should clarify is the color code. On this one, well, I can use my hand here, but this is uh 
10,000 with red and minus 50,000 with blue. Whereas this one is 100. Because you, you had to refine the when you assign the colors to the data. That one's only 100. So it's way more resolution than the one on the pipeline. Uh, I was shocked actually when I saw that how clear it was because it's just a cornfield and that came out nicely. I guess no surface indication. Nothing. Not at all. No. What do those, what type here do that do? That's archaic. The Skunk River is right there and it goes uh, three oh. to five thousand. Archaic? They had cremation. Yes. Bottles. So that's. Well, it's never been that dug. Way? Yeah, I mean, I mean that kind of know it. Spoil, right? Yes, yes. Uh, a lot of I would think that would be like, I was, I would think there'd be like a, a high point in the data where the cremation was. Because that's, to give you an idea of that red dot, that's like, what is that, 15 meters across. So unless there's multiple cremations, I don't know if it would be that. And there probably was cremation, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of think that signature is a portion of redeposited soils and fire affected rock and fire affected soil. I don't know which one. And I did do a project recently in Florida. I don't know, we're kind of running out of time, but um, there was a, I was asked to go down and do uh, Florida Hilliard. I did both. And the data, so that mound, that's uh, not really one, more pictures. <laughs> um, this is what it's going to look like. If you look at it now, the area is like beautiful oak tree area, farmland. This is what's going to be happening. Something like 3,000 houses. Yeah, and there's burial mounds here and here. He's willing to set them aside if we can tell him where to do it. <laughs> okay, it puts a little pressure on me. But yeah, the data, when I did that with the magnetometer over the area we knew the mound was, also had the stories on top. And it was mucked around, there was brick around everywhere. And it didn't get that nice, perfectly round signature over it. Um, but let's see here. Well, that's a 1936 map of it. That's 1954. That's a potential mound area. That's what it looks like now. This is the research fun part where you know you find um, where the idea came from. It was a site that a guy recorded in the 1850s when he was hunting. And there was a, um, a mound there that he recorded, but he didn't know where it was. He said, he probably gave some coordinates, but it was in God knows what coordinate system. And uh, we didn't, couldn't really follow up with it from that. Yeah, that's the Boggy Creek Mound. Uh, well, I can go into anything else, but we, you know, we don't need our sleep. So, <laughs> <laughs> any questions about the virtual world? Well, um, uh, uh, Bill Gerber turned in, tuned in late. Apologies, you've already mentioned it, but remote sensing techniques have been used by the Brits for archaeological for research for many years. Yeah. Yep. Um, yeah, they're way ahead of us. Yep. I did Many my people are, so. I did my masters in, in England yeah. and I know how far behind we are on that. So that's that is part of it. Yeah, well then thank you. Well, thank you. And thank you everyone for joining us.